So this conference and this day is a tribute to Paul Ohm, who all of you here know. And there's nothing that gives me more pleasure, both in terms of helping to lead Silicon Flatirons and as dean, than having watched both Paul and Brad Bernthal, who may be at different points of the day, um, having developed, call it whatever you want it, a franchise, an initiative, using the platform of Silicon Flatirons and what it has launched in both cases is something extraordinary. A vacuum that people may not have fully appreciated uh, was there. And the vacuum that Paul is filling here is bringing together people across disciplines, call it boundary jumping, in a really interesting way. How many people here would say they're primarily business people and how they think of themselves? How many people would say they're primary practicing lawyers? How many people would say they're technologists? How many people here are students? Okay, that's, that's what we're talking about. That is the magic of what this event is, of what Silicon Flatirons is about. And what's wonderful is this community continues to engage in different ways over time with uh, lots of repeat players in the best sense of the word. So Ed Felton has been here at multiple conferences. In fact, Paul and I had to get into a little bit of an arm wrestle <laughs> where I hold a conference on internet policy, which will be in a few weeks. And I traditionally had invited Ed to that conference. And Paul said, well, we can't invite Ed to two conferences three weeks apart. Um, so uh, I really like him at my conference. And I said, OK. Um, and then Julie Brill, who will be here today, uh, had a similar sort of you know, tug of war. And Edith Ramirez, who will be at the other conference, et cetera. So um, these are related issues. And hopefully all of you get the Silicon Flatiron spirit, both in terms of working across boundaries with one another, getting to know different types of people, as well as trying out these different events. So if you're primarily a privacy law practitioner who doesn't know as much about entrepreneurial companies, you'll have lots of chances to get to know them. One really fun event that Brad Bernthal's holding in the yearly entrepreneurship conference is sci-fi and entrepreneurship as a theme. And there's a lot of fun stuff there. Obviously, the privacy issues will be important. And we'll have one of the producers of the Movie Minority Report. Um, and for those who uh, think about circumvention technologies, you probably haven't thought about removing your eye. But for those who've seen that movie, understand the reference. So that's one of the things I would hope for all of you. And obviously, um, uh, the, the thing that is really exciting is the great conversations today that will happen with lots of different sorts of people. Um, the big torture for me about becoming dean is I can't actually enjoy those. So please enjoy those. Uh, and I look forward to hearing from you guys at the end of the day a little bit more about it. Uh, and I know many of you and those of you who I um, will get to see at lunch, uh, please fill me in. Uh, really, thank you guys all so much for coming. You're a fabulous community. For all the people here who have been part of this over time, people who are new, welcome. And my one, one lasting biggest request is during the times when you have breaks, uh, particularly the reception, please uh, engage our students. Paul has taught a number of privacy related courses. The level of savvy among our students, their interest in getting to know you is really high. I have found it's easier to ask the professionals in the room to engage the students and vice versa. So please help me out in that effort. And um, thank you again. And without further ado, turn it back to Paul. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Phil. Uh, and, and really, this conference is the kind of continued lasting legacy of that man. Uh, not only who supported the center and, and created it, uh, but really created the model with this February conference. And if you don't know about it, all of our conferences upcoming are described in the back inner jacket of your program. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic conference. In fact, it's probably nearly sold out. Uh, but if you're interested in tech policy and you want to see the people who decide tech policy, uh, you, should, you should come to that as well. OK, so for those of you who missed uh, the introductory remarks, last night at dinner we decided to do something strange, which was, uh, it is, right, right, right. So the President of the United States is set to speak right now. He's six, he's six minutes late, as we expected him to be. Um, and so as soon as you see him walk into the upper right screen, start waving at me, and I will uh, suspend my introduction. Um, this marks a really interesting moment for this room you're in uh, for two reasons. One, we've jacked up the AT&T wireless signal in this room, so your cell phones won't die today if you're an AT&T customer. I'm happy about that. Secondly, this is all new technology. We've never played with any of this. So my question for our IT wizards is, is there a way to do like picture in picture, although we're already at picture in picture, like this might, we might, you know, create the matrix here. Well, okay. If you can get my slides and the C-SPAN, why don't John? Why don't you switch to Obama as soon as he's on the screen? Okay. Um, 
So welcome to the conference. Uh, let's, let's begin it proper. Um, the one thing I do want to highlight uh, administratively is that we do have a Twitter hashtag. Uh, it's hashtag Flatirons. Uh, when I moderate and I urge my other moderators, uh, we'll look at the stream of questions and rude comments directed at us. Um, and, and we may ask some of those of our panelists. Um, I, I, I apologize in advance to the people of the world who want to talk about hair flat irons because that's what this hashtag is also used for and it always engenders a lot of confusion on days of our conference. Um, the, se the second announcement is uh, the restrooms are on this floor at the very, very, very opposite end of this floor. Um, we have lunch for you as well, so uh, thank you once again for your attendance. And then one thing I don't often do, but I really am glad to do this year, um, is I want to, be because they'll just appear later on, uh, take a minute to talk about my wonderful uh, cohort of co-moderators. Um, so you will hear from Scott Peppett, a colleague of mine on the faculty, Harry Surden, uh, a colleague of mine on the faculty, and here's where I get to be like a proud papa, uh, Meg Ambrose, <laughs> a new professor uh, at Georgetown's Department of Communications, Culture, and Technology. Um, these are one of the most gratifying things about being at this law school is I have these colleagues, I have this community of support, um, and they're going to moderate the rest of the panel. So in advance, please thank the moderators for their hard work today. Okay. So, so two years ago, this is, the, this is the fifth annual conference on privacy. Two years ago, I stood at this podium and I said, um, one thing I want to do is I want to create a conference with a thesis, an argument. I don't want it to just be like a mishmash of topics. Um, I want to argue something from my own point of view. Uh, I'm gonna, this year, I'm stepping it up a notch. This is a conference with a thesis and a PowerPoint. Um, I actually want to make an argument, or not even an argument, I want to level set. I want to talk a little bit about why I chose this topic. So this was a tweet I tweeted one year ago from that seat right there in the middle of this conference. Uh, how about we make the next conference the new frontiers of privacy harm? Uh, you can see that once I have an idea, I never move past it. Uh, and what I'll say is the interesting thing that happened when I tweeted this was, and you can look up who these people are, I'm not going to name them, about four or five people instantly understood why I wanted to have this conversation. They, they favorited the tweet. They said, this is a great idea. Um, and then I had a couple of people chime in, friends of mine as well, who said, no, 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 this is wrong, Paul. Why are you always so negative? Why are you focused on harm? Why aren't we talking about the benefits of data use? Um, but the argument I want to throw out to you is that harm is something that's been neglected by those who want more privacy more often than those who want more data usage. Uh, those who seek to raise arguments for regulation are the, one who, the ones who in many ways I think need to refocus on privacy harm. So the thesis statement for this conference is let's talk about harm much more seriously in a more extended way and frankly in a way that I think people who want more privacy are going to learn is a way that may get them some traction in places like DC. So that's the, as I say, thesis statement for now. Um, but because, you know, I don't know if any panelist today is going to do this, uh, I wanted to just give you three and a half more minutes on what scholars have said about the harms of privacy. And we have scholars here today who are going to publish papers in our journal, and I'm very excited about that. And I think that this is the uh, launching off point for most of them. So what is pri privacy harm? For a lot of us, privacy harm has been informed in the last 10 years by a gentleman named Daniel Solov. Daniel Solov's a law professor at George Washington University. He's written numerous articles and in an influential book called Understanding Privacy. I commend it to all of you. Uh, it lives up to that ambitious title. Um, and here's what he says about privacy harm. Well, the first thing he says is, we're not going to use that word. Right? To Dan Solov, privacy raises problems, but not all of them fit under the umbrella of harm properly understood. And so in its place, he invokes Wittgenstein, and that's the last time you'll ever hear me name a philosopher today. And he says that privacy is actually a multitude. It is many different things that are problems that can be grouped together, but aren't necessarily all harmful. Um, and in the end, he comes up with a taxonomy of 14, I believe? No, 16. 16 different problems that we face in society, largely because of the way technology has disrupted information flows. And he groups those into four larger groups. Enormously influential. Many law review articles will start from Solov's taxonomy. Once again, I recommend them to you, but here's a mild critique of them. They're complex, right? You give me a taxonomy of 16 things, and you really have just kind of started to restate the problem. But it's hard as an analytic tool 
to do a lot more with them. But I think more incisively, and what I'm trying to get to today is they're very, very, very much tied to the theorist's view of the world. They're not tied directly to the legal rules that we have. And increasingly, they're not tied to the way policy gets discussed, debated, and decided in Washington, D.C., when I'm putting under the label of the political economy. Uh, as many of you in the room know, maybe all of you in the room know, I spent a year at the Federal Trade Commission. This is kind of, I'm on my, what do they call it when I'm, I don't want to get the bends, so I'm at the... <laughs> 10-foot mark right now, um, but I'm almost a full academic again. Um, and so it's not an accident that I'm thinking a lot about this last question. How is privacy debated in DC? What matters to Congress? What matters to agencies? And I'm not sure that this is directly responsive to that. Okay, so here's what I'm thinking of. It's a new conceptualization. It's not radical. In fact, it's going to sound very familiar to a lot of the scholars in the room, and I hope it's a basis for the conversation. We should think about these things in different taxonomic Categories, ones that are tied much more to history and to political economy. I've come up with three categories. I hope people will talk about them, um, and maybe we can quibble on whether or not these are the right three, ancient, traditional, and modern. Especially for the students in the room, let me just do a whirlwind tour through the three of them. What are ancient privacy harms? Here's some characteristics. They're long-lived, meaning they've been recognized by law for a long time. They're easy to measure. They're often monetary, in fact. They're concrete. They're largely focused on the individual. For each of these, I'm going to tell you who is kind of associated with it. In this case, we need, have ancient harms. We need someone with a wig. Uh, Blackstone, right? So Blackstone set out the treatise uh, on, on English law, which has a chapter on torts, which talks about some of these things. And let me give you some examples. And you'll notice that some of these are not Blackstonian. They're actually quite modern. But they still fall under what I think is the ancient rubric, breach of confidentiality, defamation, inflection of emotional distress, blackmail. And then the last two are really the newer ones, identity theft, stalking. I guess we've had things like stalking for quite a while. Um, these have great success in salience in DC. They understand what you mean when you talk about identity theft. I think you're going to hear the word target a lot today. And you're not going to hear it followed by the word pregnancy, which is kind of a surprise. Um, <laughs> That's because identity theft is one of the, and if you don't get that inside joke, let's talk about it during the break. Um, that's, that's one of the ancient harms, in, at least as I'm classifying them. Okay, what are traditional privacy harms? Traditional privacy harms, here's some characteristics. They're harder to measure. So traditional is not in the sense that you would think of it. It just is because the last 100 years, this is how we thought of privacy. It's tied to dignity and emotion and inviolate personality. Um, it really focuses on the difference between the public and the private. It thinks about things you do in the square as not being protected by privacy at all. It's focused on the individual. And sometimes critics say it is about creepiness and nothing more. And again, that's a word I expect you'll hear a lot today. Here's some examples. Oh, uh, who? Uh, Warren Brandeis, landmark law review article, maybe the most important law review article ever written, uh, The Right to Privacy. Prosser crystallized this in the four privacy torts. Here they are, intrusion upon seclusion, public disclosure, private facts, false light and appropriation. And I would put under this part of the rubric the sectoral privacy statutes, HIPAA, FERPA, the Video Privacy Protection Act, Driver's Privacy Protection Act, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. In my mind, and again, we can quibble on whether I'm doing this right, that's where these belong. Last but not least are the modern privacy harms. What are their characteristics? They're tied to autonomy. They're tied to fundamental human rights. They spring forth from liberal theory. Increasingly, they're springing forth from postmodern theory. They recognize privacy in public. And the reason they recognize it is because of the way technology is like facial recognition uh, and cell phone locator beacons are implicating what we might think of as privacy in public in ways we haven't before. And one of the most important moves they do is they move from the individual to the group and the society. When we think about modern privacy harms, we think of a huge cast of characters, people who are legal scholars who have been writing uh, persuasive works for decades, but increasingly in the last decade. Uh, two articles, in fact, have been written just naming these people. They're called the New Privacy Movement or the Information Privacy Law Project. They're wonderful scholars, Julie Cohen, Anita Allen, Paul Schwartz. Uh, Paul Schwartz talks about the effects of, of surveillance on deliberative democracy. Julie Cohen talks about it on your ability to evolve as a complete human being. Um, these are theories that, again, are, are lofty. They're ambitious. They're based on rights. I might even classify it Neil Richards, who talks about intellectual privacy. Oh, here we go. All right, let's, let's turn it over to this man. I'd like to preside after this. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Please have a seat. Hey, you're welcome. Sure. <laughs> At the dawn of our republic, a small secret surveillance committee uh, born out of the Sons of Liberty was established in Boston. And the group's members included Paul Revere. At night, they would patrol the streets, reporting back any signs that the British were preparing raids against America's early patriots. Throughout American history, intelligence has helped secure our country and our freedoms. In the Civil War, Union balloons reconnaissance tracked the size of Confederate armies by counting the number of campfires. In World War II, code breakers gave us insights into Japanese war plans. And when Patton marched across Europe, intercepted communications helped save the lives of his troops. After the war, the rise of the Iron Curtain and nuclear weapons only increased the need for sustained intelligence gathering. And so, in the early days of the Cold War, President Truman created the National Security Agency, or NSA, to give us insights into the Soviet bloc and provide our leaders with information they needed to confront aggression and avert catastrophe. Throughout this evolution, we benefited from both our Constitution and our traditions of limited government. U.S. intelligence agencies were anchored in a system of checks and balances, with oversight from elected leaders and protections for ordinary citizens. Meanwhile, totalitarian states like East Germany offered a cautionary tale of what could happen when vast, unchecked surveillance turned citizens A good word, John. Maybe we can just do the audio. Yeah. White House, White House.gov might be better, John. Can you go to White House.gov? Thank you. Internet made these threats more acute as technology erased borders and empowered individuals to project great violence as well as great good. Moreover, these new threats raised new legal and new policy questions. For while few doubted the legitimacy of spying on hostile states, our framework of laws was not fully adapted to prevent terrorist attacks by individuals acting on their own or acting in small ideological ideologically driven groups on behalf of a foreign power. The horror of September 11th brought all these issues to the fore. Across the political spectrum, Americans recognized that we had to adapt to a world in which a bomb could be built in a basement and our electric grid could be shut down by operators an ocean away. We were shaken by the signs we had missed leading up to the attacks, how the hijackers had made phone calls to known extremists and traveled to suspicious places. So we demanded that our intelligence community improve its capabilities and that law enforcement change practices to focus more on preventing attacks before they happen than prosecuting terrorists after an attack. It is hard to overstate the transformation America's intelligence community had to go through after 9-11. Our agencies suddenly needed to do far more than the traditional mission of monitoring hostile powers and gathering information for policymakers. Instead, they were now asked to identify and target plotters in some of the most remote parts of the world 
and to anticipate the actions of networks that by their very nature cannot be easily penetrated with spies or informants. And it is a testimony to the hard work and dedication of the men and women of our intelligence community that over the past decade, we've made enormous strides in fulfilling this mission. Today, new capabilities allow intelligence agencies to track who a terrorist is in contact with and follow the trail of his travel or his funding. New laws allow information to be collected and shared more quickly and effectively between federal agencies and state and local law enforcement. Relationships with foreign intelligence services have expanded and our capacity to repel cyber attacks have been strengthened. And taken together, these efforts have prevented multiple attacks and saved innocent lives, not just here in the United States, but around the globe. And yet, in our rush to respond to a very real and novel set of threats, the risk of government overreach, the possibility that we lose some of our core liberties in pursuit of security, also became more pronounced. We saw in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, our government engaged in enhanced interrogation techniques that contradicted our values. As a senator, I was critical of several practices, such as warrantless wiretaps. And all too often, new authorities were instituted without adequate public debate. Through a combination of action by the courts, increased congressional oversight, and adjustments by the previous administration, some of the worst excesses that emerged after 9-11 were curbed by the time I took office. But a variety of factors have continued to complicate America's efforts to both defend our nation and uphold our civil liberties. First, the same technological advances that allow U.S. intelligence agencies to pinpoint an al-Qaeda cell in Yemen or an email between two terrorists in the Sahel also mean that many routine communications around the world are within our reach. And at a time when more and more of our lives are digital, that prospect is disquieting for all of us. Second, the combination of increased digital information and powerful supercomputers offers intelligence agencies the possibility of sifting through massive amounts of bulk data to identify patterns or pursue leads that may thwart impending threats. It's a powerful tool. But the government collection and storage of such bulk data also creates a potential for abuse. Third, the legal safeguards that restrict surveillance against U.S. persons without a warrant do not apply to foreign persons overseas. This is not unique to America. Few, if any, spy agencies around the world uh, constrain their activities beyond their own borders. And the whole point of intelligence is to obtain information that is not publicly available. But America's capabilities are unique. And the power of new technologies means that there are fewer and fewer technical constraints on what we can do. That places a special obligation on us to ask tough questions about what we should do. And finally, intelligence agencies cannot function without secrecy, which makes their work less subject to public debate. Yet there is an inevitable bias, not only within the intelligence community, but among all of us who are responsible for national security, to collect more information about the world, not less. So in the absence of institutional requirements for regular debate, and oversight that is public as well as private or classified, the danger of government overreach becomes more acute. And this is particularly true when surveillance technology and our reliance on digital information is evolving much faster than our laws. For all these reasons, I maintained a healthy skepticism toward 
our surveillance programs after I became president. I ordered that our programs be reviewed by my national security team and our lawyers. And in some cases, I ordered changes in how we did business. We increased oversight and auditing, including new structures aimed at compliance. Improved rules were proposed by the government and approved by the Foreign Intelligence Sur uh, Surveillance Court. And we sought to keep Congress continually updated on these activities. What I did not do is stop these programs wholesale. Not only because I felt that they made us more secure, but also because nothing in that initial review and nothing that I've learned since indicated that our intelligence community has sought to violate the law or is cavalier about the civil liberties of their fellow citizens. To the contrary, in an extraordinarily difficult job, one in which actions are second-guessed, success is unreported, and failure can be catastrophic, the men and women of the intelligence community, including the NSA, consistently follow protocols designed to protect the privacy of ordinary people. They're not abusing authorities in order to listen to your private phone calls or read your emails. When mistakes are made, which is inevitable in any large and complicated human enterprise, they correct those mistakes. Laboring in obscurity, often unable to discuss their work even with family and friends, the men and women at the NSA know that if another 9-11 or massive cyber attack occurs, they will be asked by Congress and the media why they failed to connect the dots. What sustains those who work at NSA and our other intelligence agencies through all these pressures is the knowledge that their professionalism and dedication play a central role in the defense of our nation. Now, to say that our intelligence community follows the law and is staffed by patriots is not to suggest that I or others in my administration felt complacent about the potential impact of these programs. Those of us who hold office in America have a responsibility to our Constitution. And while I was confident in the integrity of those who lead our intelligence community, it was clear to me in observing our intelligence operations on a regular basis that changes in our technological capabilities were raising new questions about the privacy safeguards currently in place. Moreover, after an extended review of our use of drones in the fight against terrorist networks. I believed a fresh examination of our surveillance programs was a necessary next step in our effort to get off the open-ended war footing that we've maintained since 9-11. And for these reasons, I indicated in a speech at the National Defense University last May that we needed a more robust public discussion about the balance between security and liberty. Of course, what I did not know at the time is that within weeks of my speech, an avalanche of unauthorized disclosures would spark controversies at home and abroad that have continued to this day. Now, given the fact of an open investigation, I'm not going to dwell on Mr. Snowden's actions or his motivations. I will say that our nation's defense depends in part on the fidelity of those entrusted with our nation's secrets. If any individual who objects to government policy can take it into their own hands to publicly disclose classified information, then we will not be able to keep our people safe or conduct foreign policy. Moreover, the sensational way in which these disclosures have come out has often shed more heat than light, while revealing methods to our adversaries that could impact our operations in ways that we may not fully understand for years to come. Regardless of how we got here, though, the task before us now is greater than simply repairing the damage done to our operations or preventing more disclosures from taking place in the future. Instead, we have to make some important decisions about how to protect ourselves 
and sustain our leadership in the world while upholding the civil liberties and privacy protections that our ideals and our Constitution require. We need to do so not only because it is right, but because the challenges posed by threats like terrorism and proliferation and cyber attacks are not going away anytime soon. They are going to continue to be a major problem. And for our intelligence community to be effective over the long haul, we must maintain the trust of the American people and people around the world. This effort will not be completed overnight. And given the pace of technological change, we shouldn't expect this to be the last time America has this debate. But I want the American people to know that the work has begun. Over the last six months, I created an outside review group on intelligence and communications technologies to make recommendations for reform. I consulted with the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, created by Congress. I've listened to foreign partners, privacy advocates, and industry leaders. My administration has spent countless hours considering how to approach intelligence in this era of diffuse threats and technological revo revolution. So before outlining specific changes that I've ordered, let me make a few broad observations that have emerged from this process. First, everyone who has looked at these problems, including skeptics of existing programs, recognizes that we have real enemies and threats and that intelligence serves a vital role in confronting them. We cannot prevent terrorist attacks or cyber threats without some capability to penetrate digital communications, whether it's to unravel a terrorist plot, to intercept malware that targets a stock exchange, to make sure air traffic control systems are not compromised, or to ensure that hackers do not empty your bank accounts. We are expected to protect the American people. That requires us to have capabilities in this field. Moreover, we cannot unilaterally disarm our intelligence agencies. There's a reason why Blackberries and iPhones are not allowed in the White House Situation Room. We know that the intelligence services of other countries including some who feign surprise over the Snowden disclosures, are constantly probing our government and private sector networks and accelerating programs to listen to our conversations and intercept our emails and compromise our systems. We know that. Meanwhile, a number of countries, including some who have loudly criticized the NSA, privately acknowledge that America has special responsibilities as the world's only superpower that our intelligence capabilities are critical to meeting these responsibilities and that they themselves have relied on the information we obtain to protect their own people. Second, just as ardent civil libertarians recognize the need for robust intelligence capabilities, those with responsibilities for our national security readily acknowledge the potential for abuse as intelligence capabilities advance and more and more private information is digitized. After all, the folks at NSA and other intelligence agencies are our neighbors. They're our friends and family. They've got electronic bank and medical records like everybody else. They have kids on Facebook and Instagram, and they know more than most of us the vulnerabilities to privacy that exist in a world where transactions are recorded and email and text and messages are stored and even our movements can increasingly be tracked through the GPS on our phones. Third, there was a recognition by all who participated in these reviews that the challenges to our privacy do not come from government alone. Corporations of all shapes and sizes track what you buy, store and analyze our data, and use it for commercial purposes. That's how those targeted ads pop up on your computer and your smartphone periodically. But all of us understand that the standards for government surveillance must be higher. Given the unique power of the state 
It is not enough for leaders to say, trust us, we won't abuse the data we collect. For history has too many examples when that trust has been breached. Our system of government is built on the premise that our liberty cannot depend on the good intentions of those in power. It depends on the law to constrain those in power. I make these observations to underscore that the basic values of most Americans when it comes to questions of surveillance and privacy converge a lot more than the crude characterizations that have emerged over the last several months. Those who are troubled by our existing programs are not interested in repeating uh, the tragedy of 9-11. And those who defend these programs are not dismissive of civil liberties. The challenge is getting the details right, and that is not simple. In fact, during the course of our review, I've often reminded myself I would not be where I am today were it not for the courage of dissidents like Dr. King, who were spied upon by their own government. And as president, a president who looks at intelligence every morning, I also can't help but be reminded that America must be vigilant in the face of threats. Now, fortunately, by focusing on facts and specifics rather than speculation and hypotheticals, this review process has given me, and hopefully the American people, some clear direction for change. And today I can announce a series of concrete and substantial reforms that my administration intends to adopt administratively or will seek to codify with Congress. First, I have approved a new presidential directive for our signals intelligence activities, both at home and abroad. This guidance will strengthen executive branch oversight of our intelligence activities. It will ensure that we take into account our security requirements, but also our alliances, our trade and investment relationships, including the concerns of American companies, and our commitment to privacy and basic liberties. And we will review decisions about intelligence priorities and sensitive targets on an annual basis so that our actions are regularly scrutinized by my senior national security team. Second, we will reform programs and procedures in place to provide greater transparency to our surveillance activities and fortify the safeguards that protect the privacy of U.S. persons. Since we began this review, including information being released today, We've declassified over 40 opinions and orders of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which provides judicial review of some of our most sensitive intelligence activities, including the Section 702 program targeting foreign individuals overseas and the Section 215 telephone metadata program. And going forward, I'm directing the Director of National Intelligence, in consultation with the Attorney General, to annually review for the purposes of declassification, any future opinions of the court with broad privacy implications, and to report to me and to Congress on these efforts. To ensure that the court hears a broader range of privacy perspectives, I'm also calling on Congress to authorize the establishment of a panel of advocates from outside government to provide an independent voice in significant cases before the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Third, we will provide additional protections for activities conducted under Section 702, which allows the government to intercept the communications of foreign targets overseas who have information that's important for our national security. Specifically, I'm asking the Attorney General and DNI to institute reforms that place additional restrictions on government's ability to retain, search, and use in criminal cases communications between Americans and foreign citizens incidentally collected under Section 702. Fourth, in investigating threats, the FBI also relies on what's called national security letters, which can require companies to provide specific and limited information to the government without disclosing the orders to the subject of the investigation. 
Now, these are cases in which it's important that the subject of the investigation, such as a possible terrorist or spy, isn't tipped off. But we can and should be more transparent in how government uses this authority. I've therefore directed the Attorney General to amend how we use national security letters so that this secrecy will not be indefinite, so that it will terminate within a fixed time unless the government demonstrates a real need for further secrecy. We will also enable communications providers to make public more information than ever before about the orders that they have received to provide data to the government. This brings me to the program that has generated the most controversy these past few months, the bulk collection of telephone records under Section 215. Let me repeat what I said when this story first broke. This program does not involve the content of phone calls or the names of people making calls. Instead, it provides a record of phone numbers and the times and lengths of calls. Metadata that can be queried if and when we have a reasonable suspicion that a particular number is linked to a terrorist organization. Why is this necessary? The, the program grew out of a desire to address a gap identified after 9-11. One of the 9-11 hijackers, Khalid al-Mindar, made a phone call from San Diego to a known contact with as quickly as possible. And this capability could also prove valuable in a crisis. For example, if a bomb goes off in one of our cities and law enforcement is racing to determine whether a network is poised to conduct additional attacks, time is of the essence. Being able to quickly review phone connections to assess whether a network exists is critical to that effort. In sum, the program does not involve the NSA examining the phone records of ordinary Americans. Rather, it consolidates these records into a database that the government can query if it has a specific lead. A consolidation of phone records that the companies already retain for business purposes. The review group turned up no indication that this database has been intentionally abused. And I believe it is important that the capability that this program is designed to meet is preserved. Mm. Having said that, I believe critics are right to point out that without proper safeguards, this type of program could be used to yield more information about our private lives and open the door to more intrusive bulk collection programs in the future. They're also right to point out that although the telephone bulk collection program was subject to oversight by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court and has been reauthorized repeatedly by Congress, it has never been subject to vigorous public debate. For all these reasons, I believe we need a new approach. I am therefore ordering a transition that will end the Section 215 bulk metadata program as it currently exists and establish a mechanism that preserves the capabilities we need without the government holding this bulk metadata. This will not be simple. The review group recommended that our current approach be replaced by one in which the providers or a third party retain the bulk records with government accessing information as needed. Both of these options pose difficult problems. 
relying solely on the records of multiple providers, for example, could require companies to alter their procedures in ways that raise new privacy concerns. On the other hand, any third party maintaining a single consolidated database would be carrying out what's essentially a government function, but with more expense, more legal ambiguity, potentially less accountability, uh, all of which would have a doubtful impact on increasing public confidence that their privacy is being protected. During the review process, some suggested that we may also be able to preserve the capabilities we need through a combination of existing authorities, better information sharing, and recent technological advances. But more work needs to be done to determine exactly how this system might work. Because of the challenges involved, I've ordered that the transition away from the existing program will proceed in two steps. Effective immediately, we will only pursue phone calls that are two steps removed from a number associated with a terrorist organization instead of the current three. And I have directed the Attorney General to work with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court so that during this transition period, the database can be queried only after a judicial finding or in the case of a true emergency. Next, step two. I've instructed the intelligence community and the Attorney General to use this transition period to develop options for a new approach that can match the capabilities and fill the gaps that the Section 215 program was designed to address without the government holding this metadata itself. They will report back to me with options for alternative approaches before the program comes up for reauthorization on March 28th. And during this period, I will consult with the relevant committees in Congress to seek their views and then seek congressional authorization for the new program as needed. Now, the reforms I'm proposing today should give the American people greater confidence that their rights are being protected, even as our intelligence and law enforcement agencies maintain the tools they need to keep us safe. And I recognize that there are additional issues that require further debate. For example, uh, some who participated in our review, as well as some members of Congress, would like to see more sweeping reforms to the use of national security letters. So we have to go to a judge each time before issuing these requests. Here I have concerns that we should not set a standard for terrorism investigations that is higher than those involved in investigating an ordinary crime. But I agree that greater oversight on the use of these letters may be appropriate, and I'm prepared to work with Congress on this issue. There are also those who would like to see different changes to the FISA court than the ones I've proposed. On all these issues, I'm open to working with Congress to ensure that we build a broad consensus for how to move forward. And I'm confident that we can shape an approach that meets our security needs while upholding the civil liberties of every American. Let me now turn to the separate set of concerns that have been raised overseas and focus on America's approach to intelligence collection abroad. As I've indicated, the United States has unique responsibilities when it comes to intelligence collection. Our capabilities help protect not only our nation, but our friends and our allies as well. But our efforts will only be effective if ordinary citizens in other countries have confidence that the United States respects their privacy too. And the leaders of our close friends and allies deserve to know that if I want to know what they think about an issue, I'll pick up the phone and call them, rather than turning to surveillance. <laughs> In other words, just as we balance security and privacy at home, our global leadership demands that we balance our security requirements against our need to maintain the trust and cooperation among people and leaders around the world. For that reason, the new presidential directive that I've issued today will clearly prescribe what we do and do not do when it comes to our overseas surveillance. 
To begin with, the directive makes clear that the United States only uses signals intelligence for legitimate national security purposes and not for the purpose of indiscriminately reviewing the emails or phone calls of ordinary folks. I've also made it clear that the United States does not collect intelligence to suppress criticism or dissent, nor do we collect intelligence to disadvantage people on the basis of their ethnicity or race or gender or sexual orientation or religious beliefs. We do not collect intelligence to provide a competitive advantage to U.S. companies or U.S. commercial sectors. And in terms of our bulk collection of signals intelligence, U.S. intelligence agencies will only use such data to meet specific security requirements. Counterintelligence, counterterrorism, counterproliferation, cybersecurity, force protection for our troops and our allies, and combating transnational crime, including sanctions evasion. In this directive, I have taken the unprecedented step of extending certain protections that we have for the American people to people overseas. I've directed the DNI, in consultation with the Attorney General, to develop these safeguards, which will limit the duration that we can hold personal information while also restricting the use of this information. The bottom line is that people around the world, regardless of their nationality, should know that the United States is not spying on ordinary people who don't threaten our national security. And that we take their privacy concerns into account in our policies and procedures. This applies to foreign leaders as well. Given the understandable attention that this issue has received, I've made clear to the intelligence community that unless there is a compelling national security purpose, we will not monitor the communications of heads of state and government of our close friends and allies. And I've instructed my national security team, as well as the intelligence community, to work with foreign counterparts to deepen our coordination and cooperation in ways that rebuild trust going forward. Now, let me be clear. Our, our intelligence agencies will continue to gather information about the intentions of governments, as opposed to ordinary citizens, around the world, in the same way that the intelligence services of every other nation does. We will not apologize simply because our services may be more effective. But heads of state and government with whom we work closely and on whose cooperation we depend should feel confident that we are treating them as real partners. And the changes I've ordered do just that. Finally, to make sure that we follow through on all these reforms, I'm making some important changes to how our government is organized. The State Department will designate a senior officer to coordinate our diplomacy on issues related to technology and signals intelligence. We will appoint a senior official at the White House to implement the new privacy safeguards that I've announced today. I will devote the resources to centralize and improve the process we use to handle foreign requests for legal assistance, keeping our high standards for privacy while helping foreign partners fight crime and terrorism. I've also asked my counselor, John Podesta, to lead a comprehensive review of big data and privacy. And this group will consist of government officials who, along with the President's counsel, of advisors on science and technology will reach out to privacy experts, technologists, and business leaders and look how the challenges inherent in big data are being confronted by both the public and private sectors, whether we can forge international norms on how to manage this data, and how we can continue to promote the free flow of information in ways that are consistent with both privacy and security. For ultimately, what's at stake in this debate goes far beyond a few months of headlines or passing tensions in our foreign policy. When you cut through the noise, what's really at stake is how we remain true to who we are 
in a world that is remaking itself at dizzying speed. Whether it's the ability of individuals to communicate ideas, to access information that would have once filled every great library in every country in the world, or to forge bonds with people on the other sides of the globe. Technology is remaking what is possible for individuals and for institutions and for the international order. So while the reforms that I've announced will point us in a new direction, I am mindful that more work will be needed in the future. One thing I'm certain of, this debate will make us stronger. And I also know that in this time of change, the United States of America will have to lead. It may seem sometimes that America is being held to a different standard. And I'll admit, the readiness of some to assume the worst motives by our government can be frustrating. No one expects China to have an open debate about their surveillance programs. <laughs> or Russia to take privacy concerns of citizens in other places into account. But let's remember, we are held to a different standard precisely because we have been at the forefront of defending personal privacy and human dignity. As the nation that developed the Internet, the world expects us to ensure that the digital revolution works as a tool for individual empowerment, not government control. Having faced down the dangers of totalitarianism and fascism and communism, the world expects us to stand up for the principle that every person has the right to think and write and form relationships freely. Because individual freedom is the wellspring of human progress. Those values make us who we are. And because of the strength of our own democracy, we should not shy away from high expectations. For more than two centuries, our Constitution has weathered every type of change because we've been willing to defend it, and because we've been willing to question the actions that have been taken in its defense. Today is no different. I believe we can meet high expectations. Together, let us chart a way forward that secures the life of our nation while preserving the liberties that make our nation worth fighting for. Thank you. God bless you. May God bless the United States of America. All right. Well, thank you. We're, uh, if nothing else, testing the proposition that you can get CLE for watching TV. Um, <laughs> So here's, here's what we're going to do. Uh, I invite the first panel to come down immediately, but there's two important changes. The president went on longer than we thought, so he, we're 40 minutes behind our schedule. What we're going to do, sad to say, is we're going to take most of that time from this first panel. Um, for the morning, add 20 minutes to the start and end times for all the morning sessions, 20 minutes, and we're going to take a little bit more out of lunch. We will put up a slide at every break uh, to talk about the new schedule, okay? Uh, so thank you for your indulgence on the, on the uh, way this changed. I'm also going to suspend um, the slides that I was doing. I might go back to them in a second, but instead I cobbled together uh, this bullet list of eight things that I heard the president propose. Um, this panel was supposed to talk about the harm of government surveillance, and we're going to do that in about 20 minutes. But I can't resist the temptation, and I've told these people this, uh, that they're the people who are here are not answering their phones while reporters are calling uh, to ask what they think about this. So I want to make some news if we can. Um, so I want to have a 15-minute conversation over what we just saw. Uh, really, really impressionistic because we're still understanding things. I'm sure they're releasing, releasing paper now. Um, I do want to say, and this goes for the entire day, we, as a rule, dispense with lengthy introductions. These are really, really, really impressive people. They're absolutely the right people you want on this stage to be talking at this moment, even if they'd rather not be. Um, and we have extensive biographies uh, in the program, so I commend those to you. But I'm going to go take my place with the rest of the panel. Um, and Susan and Omer in particular, I ask your indulgence while we wait 15 minutes before we get to your papers. Okay.
So, uh, those who have been to Silicon Flatirons in the past, we no longer have horrible desk mics that don't work. So you may hear us this time. I'm happy to report. Um, OK, so, so I don't know if I got this list right. I hope you guys have had a chance to kind of uh, look at it really quickly. I'm not going to read them all. I, I came up with eight things, but I'm sure that list could be six or 10, depending on how you slice it. And I really just want initial re reactions, right? Does this sound meaningful? Does this surprise you? Or maybe to put it another way, what's the headline tomorrow? Or what's your headline? Right? In your newspaper, what's your headline? Uh, and because you guys had only a little prep for this, I will ask for a volunteer to go first. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try. Um, I think it's not, you know, it's not unexpected that this is a conservative uh, uh, sort of move uh, uh, forward. And I think much remains to be seen. You know, the devil is in the detail here. Uh, so he does acknowledge both sides of the uh, equation, which I think everybody does. I don't see like a big revolution here. In terms of 702, I noted on Twitter also that he talks about maybe limiting use or retention, but n notably not limiting uh, collection. Um, on 215, it's sort of, a, a, again, a conservative transition from three to two hops, and then we'll see what happens about uh, retention. So he did say he will accept the uh, review panel's proposition that the government doesn't retain the data, but also said that the alternatives may be worse. So, you know, I'm not sure where that goes. And I just noted that he did not mention any of the uh, attack capabilities that were disclosed, the TAO uh, unit of the NSA, which is like a hot topic, um, I think, for all of us. Yeah, and, and I do want to say two more things about the, uh, the makeup of the people up here, in case it's not obvious in their biographies. First of all, Ashkan Soltani was to be on the last panel. He's filling in for Brian Cunningham, whose name has been blacked out here, um, who is ill and could not, could not join us. Uh, the second thing is a lot of these people have been active players in this debate. Uh, Todd Hannon worked for the Justice Department during some of this and, and had a uh, position that probably gave him uh, access to some conversations like this. Ashkan has had the byline on about half of the really interesting stories in the Washington Post about what's happened. And I suspect not the byline on some things that he's also helped out with. Ben, am I correct? Your client is? No, I'm wrong. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, your client You're is right. a gentleman named Edward Snowden. Um, so we, and Susan Freewald is one of the groundbreaking scholars in this field. So Susan, why don't you go next? OK, um, so I, my headline, and I hate to boil it down, but my headline would be um, Obama gets it but doesn't get all of it. And so um, one of the things that struck me was that he recognizes that the mere collection of all this data can be harmful. Yeah. And we had a discussion yesterday about how people seem very concerned about the target data breach, but not as concerned about NSA collecting absolutely everything that they've done. And, uh, regarding their telephone calls. Um, and I think that one thing that played out is that, that Obama kept comparing the two, which is that when we collect all this information, the information's at risk. So that was one insight I saw that was very important. Um, another one is that he recognizes that we absolutely have to have more transparency in the system, that you know, there's talk of oversight, but there hasn't been real oversight when Congress members say they don't actually understand what's been going on. And so he you know, is, pro is proceeding along with trying to improve the ability of the American people to follow what's going on and to understand um, what these measures are, and that there's a difference between the secrecy of making sure that sources and methods aren't disclosed to targets and the secrecy of the entire uh, surveillance scheme. But what I would say he doesn't get is that the incentives are currently completely skewed in the sense that, you know, he described how these people working in the intelligence committee community if, you know, if there's one event, if there's one more terrorist event and anyone is killed, and these people say things like, an American life is priceless, then they're going to all be in a huge amount of trouble. And the problem with that is that makes the, co the cost to them or the benefit from surveillance nearly infinite. And, you know, what the review panel said is you have to have a cost-benefit analysis where you take account of the cost of surveillance, and we'll talk more about that on the panel, but when the benefit of surveillance is infinite, because even a tiny percentage multiplied by infinity is still infinity, um, then you're not going to change the system. So that's what I don't think he gets. Ashkan, you had your hand up? Yeah. Sure. So um, <coughs> again, on the transparency point, um, I thought something that was not such a missing was any discussion of the R333, which is what we described as, sorry, we got. I'll speak into the mic. Can you guys hear me? 
This would help. <laughs> you got to clip. Any better? You got to clip into your tie, Ashkan. Yeah, sorry. Oh, that's right. And turn it yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, agree on the transparency points. Um, no mention of EO triple three, twelve triple three, which is um, what we described as the targeting of data centers abroad for bulk collection of address books um, and uh, information from Google data centers, et cetera. I think that's one of the most broad programs that the uh, NSA operates, and it was, there's no mention of it. It was completely missing in the, in the speech. Um, I thought the point on 215, one of the interesting pieces was the, the reference to needing timeliness on 215 for cases like the Boston bombing, or the, the bombing he was describing. Um, we were having a debate yet last night about it. I would, I would kind of infer that to mean in order to do timeliness um, between multiple um, uh, telco operators, it's likely to move more towards um, uh, a third-party solution rather than than house. Uh, oh, that would be my that would be my guess. Um, and then one small nod that he made regarding cyber capability, you know, and being able to protect the New York Stock Exchange from malware. Um, I think that's one of the more interesting points with regards to the program is the the expansion of the cyber capability while, uh, on domestic kind of targets, right? And so it, 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 it by nature involves surveillance of U.S. assets, U.S. companies, U.S. activity in order to protect the homeland. And I think that's going to be. Um, an interesting area for debate. Ben, what do you think? Well, I think I'm going to be a little bit more general and take a step back and we can address the specifics um, a little bit later. I thought it was vintage President Obama to find the middle between two straw men of his own creation. <laughs> you know, some say we should abolish the NSA, some say we should eat babies. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but let's think about where that middle is uh, and where it would have been had this reform process proceeded the way the president wants us to believe it was going to proceed. Uh, one thing he told us was that he was just going to turn to this next before this avalanche of right. disclosures. <laughs> but, but let's take him at his word. I don't know if this is on or if you all can hear me. Yeah. Flip the, the switch. Press. Everyone flip the little. Yeah. Now it is. Yeah? No? No. Keep, keep talking. In the I'm just going to keep talking. It's aimed away from you. Yeah. It looks yeah, like yeah, it's aimed yeah. away from you. Well, so, yeah. It's, it's fine now. It's fine now. Okay. So, so let's 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 just assume for a moment that that uh, that what he said is exactly correct, uh, and that some internal review process was about to commence before uh, Ashkan and his friends put this on the front page of the Washington Post and and the New York Times. Does anybody think this would have been the outcome? Um, I think it's an indefensible position. Uh, I think the reason why this is the outcome uh, is because the public was brought into this conversation. Uh, and the public was brought in through incredible journalism, uh, a, I believe, courageous whistleblower's act of conscience. Uh, and, and the outcome will be different because of that. I just wanted to, to sort of set that up as, as a frame. Um, um, I'm going to quibble with a lot of details um, from what the President said um, going forward. But today, I want to acknowledge uh, how far he has come um, in the last six months. Uh, that speech would have been inconceivable half a year ago. Todd? Um, I guess, I, the, as is typical of me, I think that this, this area defies the bumper sticker or the headline. So I would say <clears throat> don't pay attention to the headlines tomorrow. Pay attention to the articles. If you're trying to reduce this to a pithy short phrase, then you're misunderstanding the complexity of the problem. I think the President did a great job of explaining the two sets of interests that are counterposed here uh, that we need to strike a balance between. I think he brought the temperature of the discussion down and made room for focusing on the real facts and the real details in search of real policy solutions to very, very difficult problems. So I agree that this is not some giant leap forward and substantively there's not a revolution uh, that appears on the, on the screen up there, but I think it's a very important tone-setting speech and hopefully will allow us to proceed from a situation in which um, the goal is to uh, print the most sensationalistic headline um, and not to understand the facts of what's occurred and to undertake the careful, deliberate, responsible policy debate that's necessary to find the right balance. Thank you very much. That was really, really rich, and I, I enjoyed kind of being more than a fly on the wall in this conversation. The one, the one thing I didn't hear any of you highlight, and it may be because it was today's headline, or I take your point, Todd, today's articles, 
was judicial review now. We no longer have mid-level managers at NSA uh, deciding reasonable suspicion. Is that important? Is that a big step? Does that make you, those of you especially who are worried about bulk collection, sleep better at night? Or is it not really because the FISC has so much secrecy and is a rubber stamp or some, somewhere in between? Like, how do we feel about that one piece of it? I didn't hear any of you. He didn't say, he didn't say, he didn't say what the standard for judicial review is going to be. Um, we have judicial review in the 702 context, but it's a programmatic warrants. I, st I need to know the details. Right. Um, and also, he didn't say prior, prior judicial finding or true emergency, which makes it seem like it's per transaction. Well, even if it's, even if yeah. it's per transaction, you know, one of the things the review board came up with, the review committee, is that you know the way the FISC has chosen the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court is problematic. They're all chosen by the Chief Justice, who, surprise, surprise, may have a politi particular political bent. They all have to live within a certain distance from DC, uh, and they need to rethink that so there's more representation That's on that group. And the judges themselves have said that they don't have the technological expertise to really understand what they're being told. So there's a lot of, pro there's a lot of substantive structural problems that need to be addressed for me to feel better. Does anyone else? Yes, yeah, just for clarification, not all of the FISC judges have to live within a certain distance of D.C. Three of them are required to live within the immediate environs of D.C., so they can, they can be reached in emergency situations, but the, the bulk of the court is drawn from, from districts across the country. So I just wanted to clarify that briefly. Any last thoughts? Anything yeah, I think, I think it's significant. Uh, I, I think when you put a judge between the government and data, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't dismiss it. Uh, the, the FISA court is often called a rubber stamp, but it was an inconvenience enough that the Bush administration created a whole program to go around it just because they wanted to be able to do fishing expeditions and not even have to put the applications together. So, um, so yeah, anytime you put it, have, have a judge involved, obviously there are better and worse versions of it, but it's significant. Yeah, it's significant. Okay, so back to our regular programming. Look, I'm tempted to ask if there are people in the audience who have opinions or questions, but then we will never <laughs> get to the topic of the panel. That's going to be fair game during Q&A. Here is our status check. We are going until... 11.05. That will be your first break. Is that right, Amy? Yes. Amy Ellis, by the way, the indomitable Amy Ellis, who's been running the entire show. We will go till 11.05. Thank you. So for those of you who are watching on the webcast and are on the East Coast, suck it. I'm tired of converting your time zones to mine to watch NFL, so I'm not going to convert my time zones to yours. Okay, so we're going till 11.05. Um, and we're going to go in the order that we're seated up here, starting with Susan. Um, Susan and Omar, as I said, Omer, sorry, as I said, are presenting papers that they will publish in our journal. So we're going to give them 12-ish, 15-minute-ish minutes. We have a lighting system now, by the way, that we've never used before. So we hope it's really intimidating. Oral argument. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, so just give me 12 because we cut okay. everything down. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, so I'm not going to give my paper because. Um, I just, I don't have it written, so that's one. <laughs> but um, anyway, I wanted, so I, I'm, my, but the subject of my paper is what are the harms from surveillance? And um, there's so many ways to attack that. One, you know, one is to talk about what happens when people um, feel that they're being surveilled and, and how does that chill speech? And, and that's a, a really important part of the discussion, important part of the paper. And, you know, Ben uh, is part of the ACLU effort to challenge the 215 metadata program and they just wrote a brief to the Southern District where they made a lot of these arguments and they had expert testimony helping to make that case. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. I'm hoping that Ben spends some time on that. Um. But just as, as part of that, I want to quote from the um, outside review group that, that talked about some of the things that they should make sure surveillance doesn't do because it gives us a sense of what surveillance could do. And Obama mentioned some of it. Um, public officials should never engage in surveillance in order to punish their political enemies, which has happened to restrict freedom of speech or religion, and there's plenty of ways to do that, to suppress legitimate criticism and dissent, to help their preferred companies or industries, to provide domestic companies with an unfair competitive advantage, or to benefit or burden members or groups defined in terms of religion, ethnicity, race, or gender. So these are some of the things surveillance can be used for, and, th and that's obviously harmful, and I, I'm not going to elaborate now, but I will in my paper. But what I want to do is take it from a slightly different angle, which is to talk about what is the justification that we hear from uh, the intelligence community when we are told that there, there is no harm? And, let's, and how do you pick that apart a little bit? So what we've heard in the last seven months is, or eight months, don't worry about the surveillance we've been doing. It's all legal. Um, it's justified by an overwhelming need, and it's subject to meaningful oversight. And I think we've heard you know, different parts of that emphasized at different times. 
Um, so let me just break that apart. It, the first is it's all legal. The second is it's justified by overwhelming need. And the third is it's subject to meaningful oversight. So first of all, the it's all legal question. And I, I actually hear people saying, I'm not that worried because I think it's legal. Um, what does it mean to be legal? Uh, for one thing, it could be authorized by statute. Um, well, first of all, what we found out that we didn't know before is that the NSA has a tremendously aggressive interpretation of the statute um, that many people, including myself, um, including me, myself, think uh, is not justified by the statutory language. Um, that's being challenged in court. But the interpretation on, for the 215 metadata program is that if you're told you can collect only relevant information, that means you can collect everything. Um, so, so it's not clear that the statute actual, actually authorizes what the um, government believes it actually authorizes. Um, in addition, what we've learned is there are a lot of surveillance activities that are per being pursued not pursuant to statutes or not pursuant to statutes that we know, any, that we know, that we know um, because they're classified. So we've learned about, um, and through the work of Ashkan and other great journalists and through the Snowden disclosures, a lot of surveillance that is not pursuant to statutes. So it's not, in that sense, legal. Um, the other part of legal is that it's constitutional. And what I hear all the time is it's just metadata. Um, it's not content, it's just metadata, and metadata don't worry. Um, so metadata don't worry, you know, there's a, a factual response to that, which is there's a tremendous amount you can learn from someone from their metadata. There's so many great articles on it, but one that struck me was if you were going to tail someone, if you were going to actually surveil them, you would get metadata. Um, you would f see where they are going and how long they spent at each place. Um, but in addition, it, the, the idea that there's no constitutional protection for metadata is a gigantic stretch of a precedent from 1979 that covered only telephone numbers dialed and recorded by a primitive device called a pen register that actually used a pen to record the telephone numbers dialed. And in a wonderful decision that I commend you to read, which is the Clayman decision, where the judge uh, granted, although stayed, a preliminary injunction against the 215 metadata program, the judge went through a long discussion about how this precedent from 1979 just can't be stretched to accommodate and justify the collection of metadata under the current system. So according to him, it's just not constitutional. Now, I have to say in a full disclosure that a different judge uh, in the Southern District of New York came to a different decision on that and said that this precedent did apply. But it's, it's a very important constitutional question that we need the Supreme Court to resolve um, and that I've argued several times in other contexts and in briefs and in my writing um, sh should be resolved in favor of saying this metadata program, to the extent we understand it, this collection of all this information other than content, is not okay under the Fourth Amendment um, without significantly more protections and judicial oversight um, than has been accorded. Now, this new judicial oversight, very significant. Um, but I'm talking about the harms before the speech. Um, and, and again, none, none of these changes have been implemented. Okay, that's the legal part. Justified by overwhelming need, I've talked a little bit about already. Um, but, but there's two parts of it. One is that the benefit is so, so great. Um, the other is that we have not, they have not heretofore taken account of the costs. Part of that is because of the secrecy of the program. You don't have to account for costs if people don't know about them. Um, another way to think about, about the benefits is, if, is what's the efficacy? Are we actually getting anything for the costs? And the problem with um, particularly the metadata program is that uh, it actually has not been shown to be efficacious. So one of the problems I have even with this new idea is let's store the information with third parties, but what's the benefit? And, um, and when, the, um, when the program was originally disclosed, what we heard was this metadata program has helped us um, thwart many terrorist attacks. And then it came down to 54 terrorist attacks. And this is what we're hearing from the Director of National Intelligence and, and, and related people. And, then, and, and that was questioned by people like um, Udall and Wyden and, and even Senator Leahy, who knew more because they are on the special committees that get access. And, and the latest is actually one terrorist attack. This has helped us thwart one terrorist attack. And it actually, if you look at it, it hasn't thwarted one terrorist attack. It helped us find information about one guy who was giving material support to some group in Somalia, and that some material support was $8,000. So that is all the benefit that they have so far been able to claim from the seven-year collection of all of our calls within the U.S. 
every call, you know, call we made to whom, how long, um, identifying information about the call, apparently until two years ago, or uh, all of our internet addressing information for some period of time, location data, maybe now still. I'm, I'm only talking about those authorized programs, tremendous amount of, of surveillance conducted outside those authorizations. So one $8,000 sum of money is what so far it's generated. Now, Obama said, Pres I should call him President Obama. Um, Although you know him personally. But I was, an, yeah. I was a classmate. Yeah. Um, anyway, President <laughs> Obama said, look, when we're going to talk about this stuff, let's talk about facts and, I think, reality. Let's not talk about theories or hypotheticals. But then when he went to, to talk about the 215 program, the metadata program, he said, this could be useful. This could help us thwart terrorism in the future. And so what I want to hear is, before I approve of or sign on to all of my data and your data and all of the tremendous risks being, being collected anywhere, um, unless I'm going to hold it. Um, and even then, it, I still worry because it could be attacked by, um, you know, by uh, hackers. It could be attacked by, um, well, anyway, that's, I shouldn't really go ahead with that hypothetical. That was a little crazy. Um, but anyway, um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but no matter where the data is held, it's subject to attack by hackers, abuse by insiders, surveillance that the people in charge think is authorized but really isn't, um, the love in scandal, people checking up on their girlfriends, um, all these things I said before. It's, there's a risk. And you ha um, anyway, so, so that's, that's you know, justified by overwhelming need. We really have to press on that. And then the last one, and, um, green, I'm still on green. Um, the last one to talk about is subject to meaningful oversight. And, um, and that's, I, again, I mentioned this earlier, but this is something the President recognized. The P American people really haven't been able to have a debate on these programs. And, you know, the principle of representative democracy is that we elect Congress people who go ahead and make laws. And, we, and then our government is subject to the rule of law. And what we've learned is that our Congress people haven't understood what was going on. Um, they, they were not told. Um, they, were either, they, may have been, they may have had access to the information, but my understanding is the act that, that the, if you actually looked at it, they were um, provided with information in you know, a secure room where the Congress people themselves had to go by themselves. Um, they weren't allowed to bring their staffers, who were the experts, and they couldn't take notes. Um, and, and, I, and so that's kind of not the way it works. You know, the way it works is you have staffers who are experts who learn things and brief you. Um, so the, um, many, many of the um, people who weren't on these intelligence committees weren't told things. Um, and, you know, and in addition, um, what we actually learned from reading some of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court opinions is they weren't told things. So there's supposed to be, there's supposed to be oversight by Congress. That's been problematic. They're supposed to be oversight by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. If you actually read some of their decisions that have come out, each, each court for each program, the 215 metadata and the 702 bulk surveillance of content targeted overseas, the, the courts have said, for several years, you, NSA, were doing things that were not authorized, and you didn't tell us. And now you've told us, which is great, but for many years you didn't tell us. So their problem, and, and that's partly because the oversight is built on self-disclosure, um, which is a system, as a parent, I don't use for my kids. Um, it's, 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 it's a strange system. It's, does it, it's, why would that work? What are the incentives to self-disclose? I mean, it has worked some, and I'm glad it does, and I, I don't want to impugn the integrity of many of the people who work um, in the intelligence, if not all of them, uh, community, but there are incentives to go overbroad, as Obama said. There, um, there may be a, an official coming from the top um, program that is itself problematic. So even if you're doing your job, you could be doing something wrong. And so there's just fundamental problems with the oversight that we've had. So I've talked about the FISC. I've talked about Congress. I just mentioned a lot of the, a lot of the time you hear about oversight. It's oversight by the executive branch in the form of NSA agents having to self-report. And um, and there just hasn't been oversight by the American people. And there still isn't oversight. There still won't be oversight until we get to the bottom of what's been going on. And I think, again, we can learn and should learn about what the programs are without compromising sources and methods. That's got to be what, something we can do. And then lastly, this is something that I know we'll talk more about. The idea is that, the, well, the, the companies will provide oversight. And, you know, the companies are watching out for us. And, and I know that the companies have lots of very dedicated people, some of whom are here, who want to do the right thing. But what are the company's incentives? The company's incentives are to make money and to 
and usually to get along with the government. Um, and sometimes the companies don't have any control over how they're interacting with the government because it's happening in ways they don't know. So if, if, the, if the companies feel they can make money from pushing back against the government, they will. And they've started to do that a little bit. But if there's any way in which um, protecting our privacy or civil liberties, oop, I've got to be done, interferes with the profit motive, the profit motive will win, and that's just natural. Great. Thank you, Susan. So be before turning to Omar, one quick, quick follow-up. I don't want this to become a, you know, who admitted what terrorist attack, but can you just cite the admission that you were talking about? It was the one $8,000. Who, who said that in, in what venue? I think it was, um, I, well, I know that Inglis uh, talked about this when he had his interview with NPR. Yep. And then I was just checking with someone else because I couldn't quite remember, and I thought you might ask me. And I think it was Alexander has said that. It was only one. Okay. But I know, I know Leahy has said it. But NP, uh, New America just did a report. About that. About that. Okay. Great. Omer. Omer. Yeah. So uh, Susan, Paul, and the president are always a tough act to follow separately <laughs> and especially together. Um, Surveillance law traditionally, traditionally has been based on several legal distinctions, which I think in a way are proxies for privacy or more generally civil liberties harm. Uh, so one of them is the distinction which uh, Susan discussed between contents, uh, which is considered more invasive than or more sensitive uh, than metadata or non-contents. Now we call it metadata. Uh, and, you know, the third party doctrine mm, is based on that and the ECPA uh, statute itself. Uh, second, the distinction between real time interception, which is considered to be more intrusive than access to stored data in retrospect. And that's uh, also a fundamental distinction in the ECPA with the Wiretap Act and the Stored uh, Communications Act. Uh, third, there is more scrutiny for law enforcement purposes than for foreign intelligence. And this, I think, is natural law enforcement. It flows into the criminal justice system, so criminal procedure. And really, it fundamentally affects the uh, constitutional law. And uh, you can turn to the church committee and the Keith case uh, and FISA itself. Um, and then fourth, the uh, uh, protection that U.S. persons get is more robust than uh, foreign nationals. And again, this is a natural thing. As the president said, you uh, expect your country to protect its citizens uh, and their civil rights more than it does the citizens of uh, Afghanistan or Yemen. Uh, I think changes in technology have dramatically affected the risks to both national security and law enforcement, and as Ashkan pointed out, increasingly cybersecurity on the one hand, and to civil liberties on the uh, other hand. So from the security side, I'll call it the democratization of evil. So once we were concerned about superpowers and about nation states, risks emanating from that, now we are more concerned or also concerned about individuals and sometimes loose networks of individuals. And this is true both offline. So if you think of lone wolf uh, terrorists like the Boston bombers, uh, or even Al-Qaeda, which is kind of a loose network of uh, uh, terrorist organizations. Uh, and also online with, uh, you know, it was once uh, uh, cyber superpowers like um, uh, China and Russia. Now we're also looking at just individual hackers or organizations like Anonymous or the Syrian uh, Electronic Army. And I just want to point out that these organizations sometimes can be and are co-opted by uh, hostile nation states. Um, so, um, and, and this, I think, eradicates the uh, border also between uh, foreign and domestic surveillance uh, b because, you know, the Internet is global, of course, um, and the borders are more porous. You know, it's diff more difficult to defend against uh, individuals and against, like, a nation state that sort of appears with uh, tanks and battleships. 
uh, uh, and also between the military space and the civilian space. So the online infrastructure itself, which we certainly you know, uh, think is civilian today, was born military, and it's still tightly linked to military assets and to uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, which can be disrupted to really so or, or mass destruction um, to civilian uh, infrastructure. Uh, so there's a well-known saying by one of the uh, lords in the uh, UK House of Lords that uh, England is always nine meals away from anarchy. So if you just disrupt the uh, supermarket supply chain and you don't think of supermarkets as critical infrastructure, uh, what you would get is they basically they stack up only like two and a half days of uh, uh, food and you would get massive disruption and you know potential uh, anarchy with people starting to become hostile to one another. Um, uh, on the civil liberty sides, I think the big game changer, which we see here, is the ability, uh, the incentive, and sometimes the immutable reflex, I think, of national security agencies to conduct mass surveillance as opposed to uh, narrowly targeted surveillance. So I think against this backdrop, we need to assess if the legal district, uh, distinctions that I've mentioned at the beginning still make sense. Uh, so I talked about the distinction between intelligence and law enforcement becoming uh, more shady. Uh, clearly, the distinction between domestic and foreign is muddled, given that you know the cyber framework and the cloud are global. Uh, the distinction between contents and non-contents isn't so clear. So you know, even if you think about the list of URLs, is that content? Is it non-content? Um, and, you know, there's more sort of uh, 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 specific issues like uh, location check-ins uh, um, or a search on a Google map or, or an Apple map uh, or a risk score that's assigned by some automated system to the contents of a message. Is the risk score itself contents or non-contents? So that's not so clear anymore. Uh, and also, as Susan pointed out, it's not clear that content is more invasive or sensitive than non-content or metadata. So that whole balance has become, I think, undone. And then finally, the uh, distinction between interception and access to store data. So actually, we might think now that it's the other way around, that actually if you retain data and you have like a profile and you sort of uh, dip into that profile from time to time, that might be more intrusive than just scanning data on the fly, so real-time interception, which is, again, the flip side of ECPA is, uh, is now um, sort of structured. So, um, in, you know, thinking about whether mass surveillance is ever justified or what are the uh, levers that we need to apply to moderate mass surveillance, I think we need to look at some factors, and like Susan, I didn't write the paper yet, so I didn't think it uh, completely through, uh, but one of them is whether the uh, surveillance is strictly automated and to what extent is there human intervention? And I think, you know, in a way, clearly everything is automated, right? It's not like the madman sort of switchboard where the ladies sit in the background and listen to the calls. Uh, but I think the question uh, with automation is like a focus of a camera lens. Like to what extent is this looking at big data and massive data sets and sort of churning through some algorithm? And when does it focus on one individual? And I think when it focuses on one individual or you know several individuals, that's when the legal system really needs to be uh, alert and when you talk about the Smith case, you know, we talk a lot about the third party doctrine now in the Smith case. I think, you know, people tend to point out, look, Smith was like, you know, a very mundane collection of like, uh, our, right, base of uh, very basic information about one guy who like snatched a purse from some old lady in Baltimore. And it's all like this mundane thing. And you, you're you using this to sort of justify, you know, prism and section 215. It's hilarious. But on the other hand, 
you know, think about it, because Smith was focusing on an individual. He was a suspect. It's a law enforcement case. And here we are talking about a different sort of focus. This is more general. It's automated. It's mass surveillance. So, you know, I'm not saying it's uh, clear cut. And certainly, you know, of course, none of these issues are clear cut, but it's something to think about. Uh, second, uh, content metadata. I think we need to think sometimes about content as a container for non-content information, and especially in the cyber context, if the system actually looks at content but is not interested in the content for law enforcement or uh, even intelligence purposes, but only to identify signatures of you know, malware, of DDoS attacks or, or, or phishing attacks or stuff like that, then although you're looking at contents, I think maybe that should be perceived as a different risk than uh, like a wiretap listening, listening, in, listening into the, uh, how is it defined, the purpose and meanings of a conversation, because that's not really what you're doing, although you're looking at the content layer, again, whatever that means of the uh, sort of stack. Um, I think a very important issue is retention period. So as I said, real-time interception may be less risky than uh, storage and sort of going back and profiling and looking at the data. And I think the shorter, even with mass surveillance, the shorter the retention period, and certainly if things can be done on the fly or with retention for you know milliseconds sometimes, we might have much less of a privacy harm than if data are retained, and even if those data don't include contents but only uh, metadata. And then, you know, privacy by design, that's sort of a slogan, and people laugh at it, but I think it's important uh, fundamentally from an organizational point of view, so things like transparency and oversight, uh, Paul, to your question, I think it's ve still very important to interpose a judicial layer of review, you know, and I'm sure intelligence agencies will hate it, but, but it's, it's, it's an important thing. It's an outsider, and any layer of review really is, a, is important. Um, and things like anonymization, to the extent it can be performed with massive data sets, uh, um, um, that's it for me. Yellow. Yellow, thank you very much. Um, oh, well done. Whoever comes in the most under time gets drinks for me tonight. Um, <laughs> so, so before I turn to the discussants, here are the two ground rules to remind you and to inform the audience. You're going to each get five minutes to respond to the papers. And the exhortation I have on the entire day, and I plan to lose this all day long, this battle, is we're here to talk about harm. I know the temptation is to talk about benefits and to talk about solutions. The fourth panel is all about solutions. So maybe we can talk a little bit about harm. So Ben. So let's talk about harm. OK. Um, you know, when The Guardian and The Washington Post first started reporting on these NSA stories in, in early June, there was really a parade of my colleagues coming into my office saying, you know, have you talked to Greenwald? When are we going to get the stories about how the NSA is targeting human rights lawyers and targeting journalists and uh, targeting anti-war protesters? No one's going to understand this crap about mass surveillance. You know, they, they were looking for um, a redux of Hoover and the Church Committee in the 1970s because that was the frame for surveillance harm um, that they thought that you know ACLU members and our supporters would intuitively understand. Not this sort of complex and more theoretical question about um, how does mass surveillance, how does this you know, collect it all and store it forever, cause harm. Um, so I'm going to make a couple observations and then, um, and then give sort of three ideas for how we might think about uh, harm in this context. First, how, how did we get here? Uh, you know, you heard the president talking again and again about how we let our capability get ahead of our controls. Um, you know, really for the first time in our history, our intelligence agencies don't have to make resource-based decisions about uh, what they're going to collect. Um, it's technologically and financially feasible to collect pretty much everything, um, and storage is so cheap that it can be stored forever. Um, so we don't have that constraint on surveillance anymore. Uh, that, that's what I think what the president means there. Uh, and this is supported by a, a legal theory that's being advanced in litigation uh, that we're involved with and elsewhere, uh, where the NSA says essentially nothing of legal significance happens when we sweep up all of this information, even if it is 
uh, information relating to U.S. citizens, and, and, and we put it in a lockbox. Um, you know, no law has been implicated. No, the Constitution has not been implicated. Um, legal analysis really enters into the equation when we query that lockbox. Uh, but as long as it's sitting there, um, the, you know, the, the Fourth Amendment doesn't even apply at all. Um, and that's how we have, uh, you, you know, arrived at a place where the NSA is building new data centers uh, to, to house um, all of the information that it has been sweeping up and collecting. Now, uh, I have an intuition uh, about this, which is that the question of how many terrorist attacks this is preventing is the wrong question. Um, and the reason why the debate takes place in those terms is that only the threat of terrorism, the NSA believes, would justify this kind of collection activity. Uh, that, that's the only way that the American people would tolerate uh, uh, collecting all of this. But it's not really useful for that. Um, you don't find needles by building haystacks. Um, and, and I don't think, really, that that's what the program is for. Now, I think that that mass collection is enormously useful as a forensic criminal tool. Um, and that having this surveillance time machine that allows the government to hit rewind uh, and, and reconstruct uh, networks, communications, movements, and all of that uh, in the hands of people who are investigating crimes will be enormously powerful. Uh, and and you know, to, to understand that with a slightly unrelated example, you know, we can think about poor Professor Petraeus of the City University of New York. Uh, one <laughs> woman anonymously sends a nasty email to another woman, and before long, the FBI is going through thousands of David Petraeus's emails. He wasn't suspected of anything. He lost his job at the CIA. Uh, you know, th th these are the kinds of dangers, the ways in which you don't even have to be suspected of any wrongdoing, but in a world in which the government has access um, to all of this very, very intimate and powerful information, um, you, you know, we all can be threatened. Uh, my, my last sort of opening observation here is that I think what we refer to as mission creep is um, not only likely but absolutely inevitable. Uh, and here's why. Um, if you collect every dot, the dots will always connect in hindsight. If there is another massive terrorist attack, uh, it is almost certain that the information about that attack or that could have prevented that attack will be sitting in that lockbox. That lockbox is going to be blamed for the attack in the same way that the so-called wall between criminal investigation and intelligence investigation was blamed incorrectly for 9-11. Uh, and so all this information that was collected for one set of justifications uh, is going to, it's going to be open season uh, for, a, for a whole different set of, of justifications. And I think when we think about harm from mass collection, um, I, I won't do that by taking a snapshot of the way things are right now. Uh, because it's not the way things are going to stay without proper controls. Uh, I do that by thinking about where I know this is headed. Uh, and I know that if this information is sitting in a box um, that is going to be so useful to the FBI, that is going to be so useful to the DEA, that is going to be so useful to other kinds of investigators, it's not going to stay in that box. And I actually suspect, without knowing, uh, that there are a lot more stories to be reported um, already about ways in which the NSA has been funneling um, information to the FBI. So let me, let me just very quickly talk about three kinds of harms that, um, that I associate with that scenario. Uh, one, I think, is the most common harm that we talk about, and that is chill. Uh, what will it be like to live in a world in which all of our movements, our relationships, our communications are collected and stored forever, and we know that? Um, and, and we know that uh, e even if we don't do something wrong or aren't suspected, the fact that someone else might be can, can bring that up. Um, and, and really that we don't have any unrecorded moments. Uh, I do think that we can talk about that as a harm um, if it really fundamentally alters the way in which uh, we live, uh, what it feels like to be a human being, what it feels like to live in our societies. They will be less free uh, if we're all living under that kind of cloud. Uh, the second category you might call, you know, fairness or due process. Um, and, and this is independent. Um, e even if we are not consciously aware of all the ways in which information is being collected, that information is being collected, analyzed, and used in ways that might have consequences for us. And, and we see this 
already with corporate collection and consumers. Um, information that is collected and aggregated is used to assign credit scores. Uh, all, other, all other kinds of ways in which um, th that can have a real impact on our lives. And, and anyone who's ever tried to have a credit score corrected um, understands why I'm using the terms fairness and due process. Uh, it can be very, very difficult when information comes from disparate sources uh, and the conclusions that are drawn are automated. Um, I think if we uh, uh, you know, imagine what a future will be like in which the government has all this information and has automated processes, we won't be talking about credit scores, we'll be talking about terrorism watch lists, what lines we end up in in airports. Uh, we will get citizen scores that are the um, uh, you know, sort of government equivalent of credit scores, whether we call it that or not. They um, already exist. They already exist. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and the last category of harm is what Edward Snowden referred to in one of those videos that was posted to the Guardian website when he used the term turnkey tyranny. Um, when you build what he called this architecture of oppression, um, when you have these massive capabilities, um, and the only thing that is preventing us from being a government of tyranny rather than just having an architecture of tyranny is a set of rules that may turn out to be quite flimsy in the face of a real threat or a real terrorist attack. Uh, and we haven't built in stronger controls up front. Um, uh, and then we end up with a government that is powerful in ways that, that I think all of us might be frightened by. I mean, I think what the, the, the history of the Fourth Amendment reflects uh, our framers' fears of a government with too much power uh, and, and that they were more afraid of that than they were that an occasional bad guy might get away. Uh, I worry about a government that has all of this information collected for what may seem to be a narrow justifiable purpose that then expands through mission creep to many other purposes um, and then is unleashed um, on us uh, if we have the wrong leader or a certain kind of trauma. So when we think about what democratic controls might be necessary in panel four, not in this panel, Paul, um, <laughs> I, I think we need to think about not w which ones are needed now, but which ones are needed to prevent these scenarios. Great. Thank you very much. Ashkan. So um, just following on um, some of these great comments, um, I also agree with Ben that uh, I'm not a fan of efficacy kind of calculus. Um, just from a security perspective, um, it only needs to work once, right? So I don't know how many people here in the room bike, um, but when you wear a bike, you probably wear a bicycle helmet. Um, they're designed to, uh, they're kind of uncomfortable when you, you know, and they're designed to break if they're ever, if you ever have an impact, but you, the one time they're used is the one time you're happy that you were wearing one, right? And so I'm not a huge fan of trying to take that metric. Um, I do think that this whole um, chilling effects uh, kind of, um, framework is actually really um, important, right? The, the review board actually included this nod to the Fourth Amendment uh, being secure in your persons, uh, in your home, um, as, a, as a vital consideration. Um, there's been a number of ways to try to quantify this. Um, Penn, uh, the writers group, tried to do a study on like um, how many writers self-censored, and I'm not a fan of the kind of self-censoring one. Um, one I'm more familiar with is I work with a lot of um, journalists and reporters and um, researchers and um, observing the change in OPSEC behavior, you know, uh, operational security behavior, how much time uh, people are spending kind of encrypting their files and, and moving their data and not saving stuff and putting stuff in lock boxes. And a lot of it is a, a kind of um, akin to kind of virgin suicide where we, you don't actually know if it works. You're just doing these things presuming that um, it will secure uh, you from whatever threat. And, you know, the, the point today about kind of restricting, for example, data collected under 702 for criminal investigations, I think, um, helps allay some of those fears. But um, it's not clear how that information can still be used in other contexts, right? So we know under, for example, there's a supplementary procedures for metadata um, analysis um, that, that even data collected uh, incidentally on U.S. persons um, for one purpose can be used to do things like contact chaining, right? So even though an analyst is not able to look at that information, they're still able to use it and use your information to do some inferences. These kind of big data inferences that and scoring these guys are talking about. Um, I don't know if folks saw, I worked on a story regarding um, this 
the big data technique called co-traveler analytics, which looks, for example, to um, cell phone records on a on scale of about five billion records a day um, to identify who might be a potential target based on one target, right? So, you know, one of the people in this room are on, uh, publicly said they're in contact with Snowden on a daily basis. You might consider them to be a, you know, uh, potentially a target, I doubt it, but let's say, uh, and therefore everyone's phone in this room might also pop up at some score in this co-travel analytics. And so just just the fact that people are implicated, the fact that this data can be used, I think is, um, is an important consideration um, when you consider the chilling effects and that we all could be uh, uh, monitored. And then the last kind of, this is kind of an innovation forum, you know, Silicon Flatirons. Um, the last thing that sh should really be talked about is um, the biggest, one of the biggest or the biggest uh, issue of the elections last year was the economy, right? So, and then people have talked about this at length, but the fact that, um, you know, the, the, these techniques piggyback, and it was actually telling that the government, uh, the, the president mentioned, you know, we just need to be better than the behavioral advertising guys. Well, in fact, they, a lot of the research has shown that um, they piggyback on techniques like using Google cookies, Google tracking cookies, in order to uniquely identify and target um, people, or leakage from mobile apps uh, to, to identify the location of suspects. Um, and uh, this piggybacking on, kind of on the commercial side actually has a huge chilling effect in terms of the economy as well, which is from a national security perspective, something that we want to be, uh, I think one of the big, you know, one of the biggest uh, kind of security factors is that we have, a, we're in an economically viable country uh, in trade, especially in, in technology. Um, and then lastly, just a very small point uh, with regards to oversight. Um, I think one of the, the key things with regards to the FISC and, and even the PCLOB and people saying that they, that they didn't know that these programs were occurring and they were surprised to find out, um, I would argue is on account of, again, something the President said today, which is that technology has drastically tr uh, changed the way we interact. Um, and in fact, a lot of our communications and a lot of the surveillance techniques are very technical. Trust me, I've seen a lot of the docs, they're incredibly dense, written by a bunch of geeks that speak in code, and it's very hard to grasp. And so to consider how you could do oversight of these programs, extremely technical big data programs and whatnot, um, without a technical um, kind of technical uh, resources at the FISC or at the oversight boards, I think is an important question. Excellent. Last to you, Todd. Great. Um, Thank you. First, uh, I'd like to agree with what many of the folks on the panel have said. Um, I think the concept of reconsidering the privacy value assigned to different types of data and even reconsidering whether that's the right framework to use uh, to evaluate privacy harms is, is an important project. And um, so I, I definitely agree with that concept. Scrutinizing the programs um, that currently exist and understanding them thoroughly and understanding both uh, the benefit they provide from a national security perspective and the harm they impose from a privacy perspective, I think is also um, critically important. And I hope that those, those projects will, um, will ensue. I think there's a temptation which I invite everyone to resist, and particularly those of us up here and those who will be speaking on panels later, to caricature what the president said a little bit and say, we just have to be you know, better than the behavioral advertisers. Um, there's also can be a little bit of a temptation inevitably to um, pick the most dramatic uh, potential example to demonstrate something and, and suggest that we need to build protections against political surveillance and that kind of thing. And we do. It's very easy in making that point to slip into the suggestion that that actually has been occurring or is occurring or that kind of thing. And so I, I think it's very important to keep those things separate and understand the backdrop against which this policy discussion and this reevaluation of these programs um, needs to occur. I want to uh, respond real quickly to a couple of, of comments um, made sort of across the panel. Um, one was the, the um, argument, and again, I think this is a, an unfortunate caricature, that the Justice Department position was and the position that the FISC signed off on was that there's nothing of legal significance in a situation where all you're doing is, is obtaining metadata. And actually, more accurately, a subcategory of metadata 
not connected to any particular identity for any particular individual. In fact, these documents are now publicly available, and you can read the very careful legal reasoning that the Justice Department went through and the court subsequently signed off on that walks through historical Fourth Amendment doctrines and analyzes uh, the cases very carefully, um, takes the law very seriously. Whether you agree with the outcome they came to or not, it's a very uh, legally rigorous approach to, uh, to the situation. Um, in fact, arguably more so than the approach of saying, well, I understand that there's existing Supreme Court precedent that as a district court judge requires me to rule one way, that third party data is, is not subject to the level of constitutional protection that other data may be, but um, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to ignore that Supreme Court precedent and, and come out the other way anyways. And I, I think the, the decision um, in the Clayman case by Judge Leon, uh, regardless of whether substantively it's determined he was right or wrong, will come to be viewed as a little bit of a, of a judicial indiscretion um, in the sense that he did not follow what was clearly binding um, Supreme Court precedent. Um, I think it's also inaccurate to suggest that um, this, that someone may have stumbled across this information about General Petraeus because um, they were conducting a criminal investigation of him or a criminal investigation of the women. I think quite properly there was some intelligence committee attention focused on the director of the Central Intelligence Agency who you might imagine would have about as much sensitive U.S. information as, as anyone, you know, anyone in, in the country. And so I think it's probably by virtue of that fact that he is the single greatest human store of protected national, uh, national security information in the country that that information was discovered, not because there was some untoward or illegal, um, illegal uh, criminal investigation going on. I, I think, Ashkan, that and only time will tell and the president had to fit everything into only 40 minutes, uh, which is a tall order, but I think his presidential directive is meant to address EO 12333 and to expand the oversight and protections that apply when the intelligence community acts overseas, outside the scope of the FISA statute and that kind of thing. So I agree wholeheartedly. In fact, I think in a, in a way, much of the attention has been focused on FISA issues where they're, whether you think they're wholly adequate or not, is a very extensive set of safeguards and oversight in place. And relatively little has been focused on overseas intelligence activity in which there are virtually no uh, safeguards in place. I, I take his presidential directive to be um, directed at that, and I guess we'll see when we get a chance to see it and look at it more closely and that kind of thing. Um, I guess two, two last quick points, and I see that I'm on red. Um, I, I, I uh, was under the impression that the, that the Congress was not told view um, was so roundly and factually disproved by this point that, that asserting it was sort of like asserting that, that the earth was flat. Um, I, if you look out there anywhere, there is an extensive documentation of the times at which the uh, executive branch briefed the legislative branch on this and the ways in which they did it. Um, and I can tell you that it took hours and hours and hours because I did it. Uh, I sat with the intelligence committees on both sides of the hill for literally hours and talked to them about this. I sat with members of the Judiciary Committee and the Judiciary Committee staff on both sides of the hill and talked with them about these programs for hours as well. Um, and then the last thing is just you know, to say, well, it should just be about sources and methods. I agree with that wholeheartedly. It should only be about protecting sources and methods. But I think the response to that would be, this is a method. The fact that you collect this subcategory of metadata and then you conduct analysis in it in this way to try and identify terrorist actors is a method of the intelligence community. And so I think the rejoinder to that would be if the criticism is that we should only protect sources and methods, we're ready to agree wholeheartedly because we think this is a method and that's why we were protecting it. I'm not commenting on whether that um, that is a, you know, is, is true uh, or, or is, is an effective rejoinder, but I think it would be the rejoinder. So I'm not sure criticizing it on the basis of only sources and methods should be protected is, is constructive. 
I like to rule with an iron fist, so I'm going to do something that is going to make me really unpopular with the folks to my left. I'm not going to give them the opportunity right this second to respond. I'm going to invite you guys to ask questions that will get them to respond. Nor am I going to ask the nine questions I emailed them in advance that they all universally said was the most interesting thing they ever read. <laughs> not true. Um, we've got 10 to 15 minutes, but for those who have been here before, you know the Phil Weiser rule of Silicon Flatirons is the first question must be asked by a student. I see a lot of you in the audience, and I'm a professor who knows some of you and I'm not afraid to call on you. So, will one student take the bullet and help their classmates not get called on? Oh, come on. Usually this is where you're, you, you all can't help but raise your hand in class. Thank you. Thanks, Vicky. Oh, there, here comes a microphone for the webcast. Um, hi, I'm Vicki. And uh, Ben, I think I heard you say that uh, you don't think it helps to build haystacks to find needles, but wouldn't that be the same analogy as collecting all this big data in order to make those correlations? So how yeah, can you I, not I, do I that? I should have been more precise. It, it is the number one retweeted thing from this wow. point. Wow. You're, you're, you're very popular on Twitter, including Omer retweeted it, which I found interesting. From here? Yeah, from here. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, man. So, <laughs> Um, so let me make the point with a little less glibness. Um, what I mean is that I don't think, uh, I don't have a lot of confidence in the tool as a predictive one, and I have a huge amount of confidence and fear about it as a forensic one. Um, I, I think that, that you know, collecting you know, 5 billion cell phone records a day, you know, 200 million text messages a day, um, you know, all the, the, the numbers that we read are just staggering. And, and, and I, I have enormous respect for the NSA's analytical capabilities. They, they have some of the best computer scientists, engineers, and mathematicians who are figuring out how to make sense of all that information. But terrorism is such a remote event. There are so few terrorists who are trying to, to uh, you know, blow up a bomb at a marathon in Boston. Um, that I don't think that we as a society should justify spending tens of billions of dollars a year on this architecture, um, you know, with confidence that it's going to prevent those extremely rare um, events. I, I do think, again, as I said, that 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 yes, it's going to be it's 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 helpful to find the needle if the needle's already poked somebody, right? So w once something has occurred, and I recognize that 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 that. This is a loose boundary because stopping somebody who has done something once might stop them from doing a second thing that is catastrophic. So, so uh, you know, I'm not trying to make a very, very firm point here, but uh, but that's what I meant when I made. But doesn't it imply there should be no security at the airports? Like you should only react after the fact. That that's also a mass surveillance operation, right? No, I I, I think it's quite different. I mean, I think there should be security at airports to prevent people from bringing bombs and weapons. Well, there are only very few people, as you said. But it's very easy for them to walk through a detector one by one. Is it harder for them to walk to the subway or to the marathon? I mean, it's, it's even easier, I think. I, I, I think I'm missing something, because I don't see the connection. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's go to the next question. Yeah, gentleman in the front. Um, again, microphone. <laughs> Um, okay, here. Uh, right very early in the speech, just three or four uh, uh, minutes into it, uh, and I think I've got this quote correct. Um, uh, the president said, fewer and fewer technical constraints. Uh, there, there are going to be fewer and fewer technical constraints on what we can do. Uh, that is no longer correct. I work for a company called Apsio Corporation down in Highlands Ranch. And in March, we rolled out a technology that enables people to control their data when it's on other people's computers, where they can access it, print it, forward, set an expiration date, export it to an unsecure state, so forth and so on. That technology puts the decision making about what other people can do, regardless if they're a commercial or government enterprise, back into the hands of the individual. Are you are you proposing a challenge for your company? Yeah. Because uh, I, I feel like there are a lot of people in this room who would love to try and break that. I, 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 <laughs> no, Ashkan is already so working. My response on. to that is, my response on, to that is, come on in. The yeah, water's warm. Yeah. Sure, Ashkan. Go ahead. So, um, are you controlling every device and piece of platform that this software runs on? Yes. 
so that you have to only use. Okay, let, let me give you a right. quick technical, non-technical explanation. No, no. So, like, the, that, was, that was a hypothetical. The, the, the thing that I'm saying is like the so the NSA's capability or any actually security operations capability is robust in that they will collect data from the weakest point in the system. So they, they would, if your software and your platform is extremely robust and the encryption is solid, then they'll attack. Well, let, me, let me address your question now. I know and and, and I, want, I want to get the next question, but hang on. Paul, let me, let Paul, me, Paul, I, I do welcome the point, right? So this is a deep theme that we talk a lot about at the center. We talked a lot about yesterday when we debated the NSA, right? The, the perpetual arms race and the things that get thrown off that we don't intend. I mean, my guess is your technology would not work very well for a social network. Right, where you're sharing intentionally that, that with be, 500 that, people. That would actually be incorrect. Oh, it, it even protects that from, from someone reforwarding. I mean, for, there's for, the analog hole. Anyway, so I don't want to get too far into it because we could talk for an hour about these issues. Why don't but we I, really, talk after? I really do appreciate yeah. the point, and let's talk after. Thank you. Uh, we have time for at least one more quick question. I, I've scared people by yelling at the <laughs> second <laughs> questioner. All right, so, so, okay, go ahead. One more student. Excellent. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I talk a lot, well, not a lot, but uh, the idea of chill. Uh, I'd love for you to spend some more time talking about specific examples of how chill uh, and how the NSA has affected our ability to act and to think and to speak. Uh, because for me, in my personal life, I'm obviously not very important, but it hasn't chilled me. So I'd love to hear your thoughts more specifically about how it has chilled ordinary citizens. Can I, I, mean, I, I, I So, so like actually, the basic concept of the panopticon, the Jeremy Bentham panopticon, is, you know, right on point. Because when you're observed, you change your behavior. And you are, you know, you conform, you might uh, be less uh, uh, sort of uh, out of the box. And you want to add? I don't know. Anyone, anyone well, I mean, this? one of the things um, that you know, you're part of a society, and you benefit from being part of a society that has a rich and vibrant journalistic tradition, a rich and, vi and vibrant um, tradition of criticizing the government, of accepting uh, religious pluralism and uh, philosophical differences. All that is threatened in a context in which the power, the t you know, the power at the top can um, use its surveillance authority to stifle journalists, to um, go after op opponents, to um, and and you know we were talking yesterday. I mean, watch the movie The Lives the Life of Others. Of others yeah. You know, learn about totalitarian societies where when the people in charge use their power through the surveillance authority to consolidate that power, it's 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 very bad for society. Whether or not you as an individual think that you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, which I think more people probably are than they realize. And I want to respond to one other thing, which is related. We don't know of any abuses. And, you know, I, I, sus I don't want to speculate. I just w wonder how would we know? How would we know if our government were using its surveillance authorities in, uh, inappropriately? We know that historically it's always happened. We know that, the, that historically surveillance Martin is- Martin Luther King, the president- right, So that's what the church committee found, um, that the surveillance authority was used to go after journalists, to go after civil liberties, civil rights advocate, uh, activists. You know, many years before that, it was used to blackmail um, your opponent to make you know to make sure that um, that you stayed in power. So that you know, it's used by totalitarian totalitarian societies. It, we we know that when the when the surveillance power is there, it's misused. We don't have any evidence that it's been misused here. Therefore, we shouldn't worry. I just think it's a little bit of a syllogism. Todd. Yeah, I don't think it's at all true that we shouldn't worry because there's no evidence. But I do think that we should acknowledge that there's no evidence because there's no evidence. Um, and, and, and I don't think that you should feel like there's something wrong with you that, that you don't feel chilled. I think it's, I think it's okay for, for people not to live their life in fear of the NSA. I think the, NS, the NSA Stasi analogy is maybe a little bit off. And, and, and the suggestion that um, because these things were abused before the Church Commission, before FISA, before congressional oversight, before DOJ oversight, before IGs were empowered, before whistleblower statutes, before all of those things that now interpose safeguards in the system, they will be used again despite all those safeguards is faulty logic. Um, I think it makes sense to be vigilant against abuse. I think it makes sense to try and uh, ask whether there are other reasonable safeguards 
that can be put into place, but I don't think the inevitability of abuse or the, the there's something wrong with you if you don't feel chilled is is the right way to approach the question. Quick response. Yeah, and I think um, that's actually a really great point, which is that we don't know, right? But we still operate in society with some um, some assumptions about the world. Our behavior is based on probabilities of things happening, right? And the, one of the key the key points is that because of the technical advances, surveillance has become extremely cheap, right? So I typically would, my probability of someone following me around is probably low because I don't think I've done anything wrong. And so to dedicate a number of agents to follow me traditionally or implant my phone would be really low. But that calculus has changed, right? So the balance of power and the asymmetries in with regards to um, someone surveilling me has, has gotten to the point where it would be very trivial to surveil me, very cost effective for even the slightest suspicion. And so that's the behavioral kind of inference, is like my assumption about the world has changed now knowing this capability, knowing that the technology is uh, freely available and freely used. And so the, my belief that so I'm, I'm not likely to be followed is kind of, it's diminished regardless of, of, of the fact that if I believe I'm being followed or not. So Ashkan's too modest to point to his recently published work in the Yale Technology Law Journal? Uh, Law Review. Yale. Law Review Online, uh, which is about that exact point, the reduction in the cost of surveillance. Look, I think about these panels a lot, and I think for a year I'm going to wonder, did I take too much time from this panel? Because good Lord knows I want to hear more about what they have to say. But <laughs> I kind of want to try and keep the trains on time. We're all available to talk during the breaks. That's where we are right now. We want you to come back in 15 minutes. So we want you to come back at 11... What is that? 24. 11.24. And at that time, we will put up the new schedule on the screen. But before you go to your break, please thank my fellow panelists for such a